All right, so we're going to continue through our taxonomy and systematics unit. We've talked about the two prokaryotic domains. We talked about the domain archaea and the domain bacteria. Now we're going to move into our eukarya. First kingdom within our uh, domain eukarya is the kingdom protista. Now the protists are interesting because they're very, very diverse. Um, there's a great multitude of protists that exist on our Earth. Um, sometimes they call our Earth a protist Earth because there's so um, so many niches that that protists fill. Well, they're also a little bit um, well. There's 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 people who are divided as to whether protists should be a kingdom. They're so diverse. There's there's, there's such a, a wide range of organisms within the kingdom protista that some scientists feel that it should be split up into kingdoms within the kingdom protista. So we're going to look at that. We're going to see look at the diversity. We're going to look at some proposed candidate kingdoms for protists, and uh, hopefully along the way learn about the diversity, learn about their different characteristics, etc. So how do we classify them? First of all, in the big picture. Here's our kingdom eubacteria and archaeobacteria. We have them kind of obviously stemming off at the base of our kind of tree of life. They're the most archaic, the simplest. Coming from the archaeobacteria, we have the protists. And generally speaking, they're eukaryotic. They're unicellular and multicellular. Mostly unicellular, but there are some that are multicellular, some that are colonial, so they act multicellular. Um, and from the protists came the rest of the domain eukarya, came the plants, came the animals, and came the fungi. So these are extremely important. They're at the base of our eukaryotic tree. So that's why we need to know some stuff about them. Um, also why they're so diverse. They were able to spawn this great multitude of organisms, very wide range of organisms. So the candidate kingdoms we'll get to eventually, but first some background. Traditionally, historically, we used to talk about protists in terms of, well, are they plant-like, are they fungi-like, or are they animal-like? So this is, a, once again, a very large, diverse group. The algae were plant-like. Uh, we had some slime molds that were fungus-like. It actually were, used to be classified as fungi. And the protozoans, the animal-like protists. So we've dealt with the kingdom protista in the past. And currently, there still is a kingdom protista, but we're moving toward some candidate kingdoms within that kingdom. So, how are they? Um, how are they classified? How do we tell them apart? We obviously have made some great strides with biochemistry, uh, with DNA research, and so we're able to tell very, very accurately what's related to what in terms of of DNA relatedness and DNA homology. But um, outwardly, you can classify protists by the way they move. Seems pretty simple. Some move you using cilia, which are hair-like projections on the cells that help them move along. Flagella is another method of movement or method of locomotion, which is kind of a, a, a whip-like tail. And pseudopods, uh, pseudopodia, pseudo meaning fake or false pod. Um, referring to feet, false feet. So they have a projection, they kind of shoot ahead and then they pull the rest along behind it. So depending on whether they have these different ways or methods of locomotion, they might be classified differently. Here are some examples. You can see the hair like cilia. You can see the flagellum on this uh, euglena. And a pseudopod being a projection being shot outward to, in a direction of movement. What about metabolism? What about how they might they obtain their energy? Well, we've got autotrophic ones and we have heterotrophic ones. So pretty diverse. Some of them are photoautotrophic. They use the sun to, to uh, take and to create organic matter for food. Some use chemicals. Um, and the heterotrophs, some ingest. They take in food. They, um, they actively seek out food. They take it in or others absorb it. They're saprotrophic or saprophytic, kind of like fungi. They digest it outside their body and then they absorb the nutrients. Big picture. Much like the other cladogram or pseudocladogram I showed you, this is kind of a rudimentary one I drew up before doing this. We've talked about the eubacteria and the archaeobacteria. This is kind of the entire tree of life. We have these branching off early. 
you can see the archaeobacteria being more closely related to us than the eubacteria. So we continue on with time existing and time progressing in this direction. I'll point out the plants, I'll point out the animals, and the fungi. Now, these five in the middle, the archaeozoa, the euglenozoa, alveolata, straminopola, chlorophyta, these five, obviously, if we have an imaginary line here, this is where eukarya starts, everything to the right of this has eukaryotic cells. These, these five in the middle, these are the candidate kingdoms of protista. These are the categories within protista that some taxonomists are saying these deserve to be their own kingdoms. And these are the ones we're going to talk about today, starting with archaeozoa and moving to the right. So here we go. Archaeozoa, thought to be the most ancient. That's why we have it branching off first. That's why we have it diverging here. Why is it thought to be so ancient? Well, it lacks mitochondria. But recently, some DNA evidence, we talked about the advancements in biochemistry. Some DNA evidence has shown that perhaps it used to have mitochondria. So we're kind of starting to, to, to change our thinking of the archaeozoa. Maybe, they, um, maybe their systematics isn't quite what we think it is. We'll see. Uh, we talked about bacterial diseases and viral infections and how they can affect humans and other, other, other animals. Well, protists are no different. Okay? Um, archaeozoa, they can cause trichomonas. They can cause giardia, which is um, in, in dirty water. Okay, so these can be nasty creatures as well. The archaeozoa, archaea obviously meaning ancient. The euglenozoa, moving to the right on the cladogram. Um, they're flagellates. They have flagellum. Here's a, flag here's a flagellum right here. Within the euglenozoa, we're talking about the, sometimes they're called the euglenoids. We have the euglena. They're photosynthetic. You can see the, the green pigment, the chlorophyll within. Um, some are mixotrophic, which means they can, they're autotrophic and heterotrophic. Once again, a lot of them, very diverse. Not only are there the euglenophyta within this uh, proposed candidate kingdom, but there's the zoomastigophora. All right. Sometimes they're called the kinetoplasts because they have this structure called a kinetoplast, which is um, a little granule within. If you see at the base of the flagellum, there's a mitochondria in there, and there's a, a little um, within that mitochondria, and there's a small little organ that contains DNA called a kinetoplast. That's what gives them that name. Non-photosynthetic, a lot of different species of this one as well. Once again, can be a nasty little creature, can cause African sleeping sickness. Uh, this is carried by the tsetse fly in Africa. Um, in their saliva, they can transmit these, um, these different organisms to, to humans. Uh, it affects their kidneys, affects their heart, eventually their brain, and can cause death. So um, not a pleasant thing here. Moving on from Eulinozoa, the alveolata. They have alveoli which is an indentation in their cell surface. Within the alveolata, we have the dinoflagellates, the zooxanthellae, the apicomplexin, and the ciliate. So look at, look at the diversity within this candidate kingdom alone. Uh, it's pretty staggering. Let's deal with these one by one. The dinoflagellates, um, they've been in the news recently in Australia. Um, the red tides, these are um, obviously a, a group within the protists and look at this, some pictures that I just pulled off off the news of, of these uh, increased numbers of dinoflagellates in the water. You can see the xanthophyll, that's that red pigment that you're seeing in the water causing these red tides. Um, red tides can cause eye irritation, can cause skin rashes, so uh, maybe not the smartest thing that this guy's doing here, um, but not overly harmful. It can kill fish, um, so you probably don't want to eat the fish from that water. The zooxanthellae, these, these are another group within the alveolata. They have a symbiotic relationship with coral, which means that they help coral. They are photosynthetic. Uh, they live within coral. They give coral nutrients. Uh, we've had a huge problem on our planet with um, large die-offs or large killings of coral. Um, for whatever reason, and we're not sure why, the corals seem to be spitting out these zooxanthellae. We're not sure why. We need to find out why because spitting them out, they no longer get those nutrients and they die. So this is a huge problem involving these 
and coral. The apicomplexin, uh, one specific member of this group, the plasmodium, is transmitted through mosquitoes and kills millions because um, it causes malaria. A lot, big problem in Africa along with HIV. And the ciliates, you've probably all heard of paramecium. Here's a paramecium with a little bit of cilia going around the outside. All right, uh, the Stramonopola, moving on. Um, they also have flagella. Within the Stramonopola, some very interesting organisms. One of them, the diatoms. Diatoms are very interesting because they're photosynthetic and they also have silica within the cell wall. Silica is used to make glass. Here's a picture of a diatom. You can see the glassy nature of their cell walls. Okay, very, very interesting. Very cool looking things. They're used to make glass. Uh, mildew and, and water molds. You might think that this is a fungus. But uh, recall, fungi have a polysaccharide called chitin in their cell wall. That's what makes them a fungus. Um, these particular organisms have cellulose, so they can't be if they can't be um, classified as a fungus if they don't have that chitin in their cell walls. Uh, brown algae used to be called seaweed. We're talking about kelp, um, the, the the large kelp fields off the west coast. You can always see the otters um, if you're watching some geographic show. The otters are swimming around in the kelp fields. That's brown algae. It's not a plant. Now we have the golden algae as well. Here's a picture of a uh, golden algae. Some heterotrophic, um, but most are autotrophic. Uh, Chlorophyta, last one. These are the green algae. The volvox, this was the same picture that was on the opening slide. Um, this is a type of chlorophyta. They have chloroplasts, which means that they're photosynthetic. Cellulose, just like we were talking about over here in the Stramonopola. Cellulose, plant-like, right? We know plants have cellulose in their cell walls. So we've gotten through these, and you may, maybe if you've looked at protists before, you may realize that we're missing a major protist. When everybody talks about protists, they talk about paramecium, and they talk about amoeba. Well, it's a problem, because we're not sure where to put these. We're not sure where these go yet, the red algae, the slime molds the amoebas, but hopefully we'll get there. Hopefully we'll figure this out. Um, systematics is moving in that direction. So just a, an overview of protists and we'll keep going forward.